Hey folks, this is Mark Devine with the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Welcome back. I hope you're doing well. I'm recording this the first week of January 2021. So happy new year. Uh, this probably won't be released for a few weeks, so that may sound like old news, but boy, I tell you what, getting uh, through 2020 was quite a journey for many of us. So good job. I know And if you're listening, you've got an unbeatable mind, so you probably sailed through. Although if you're like me also, it wasn't without its challenges and requiring us to really, really hunker down into our practices and, and go inward and really um, check in with what's real and what's not. So good job. And we're going to continue that discussion as per SOP or standard operating procedure today with my guest, Casper Vandermeulen. It's going to be an extremely interesting show. So just stay tuned. We're going to, we're going to talk about all sorts of things around mental training and breath work and uh, overcoming stress and, you know, really going inward to transform your life, which, as you know, is something I'm, uh, I believe is critically important for all of us. Uh, having um, said all that, and before I you know, bring uh, Casper on, it really does help us um, podcasters to have reviews and ratings. And so if you haven't and you feel inspired, please rate this podcast at iTunes or wherever you listen to it. Um, it just helps other people find it. And Unbeatable Mind podcast is in the top 10. It's one of the top ranked podcasts in the health category on iTunes. So I'm pretty humbled by that. We have, I think, over a thousand five-star reviews. So it helps to keep on doing that because that motivates me to keep on doing this, right? It's not, it's not easy. There's a lot of work involved in podcasting. For those of you who do it, you know. At any rate, um, I love it. And I love pe talking to people like Casper and having a fun conversation. So Casper... Um, Casper is an author. He's an, an adventurer. Uh, he is committed, like me, to helping people unlock the power of the breath and the mind. Uh, Casper, at one point in his life, and I can't wait to hear the story in person, was overweight and burned out and uh, unhappy. You know, wow, can you imagine that? Like most of humanity seems to be like <laughs> that. And suddenly, he turned himself around, and now he's teaching He's teaching how to optimize your life, how to really ramp up and, and biohack, but more importantly, go deep into the lifestyle of, you know, of um, tapping your full potential as a human being, right? This guy has run an ultra marathons in his bare feet. Like what? What's up with that? You know, um, he's done a ton of stuff and he, like me has really gone deep on the um, the esoteric side of it you know the the traditions that really have inspired me like yoga and and um, the, the breath work of the of the masters so we're gonna and also he worked for Wim Hof or collaborated with Wim Hof for many years and so this guy knows his stuff um, Casper thanks for joining me today super stoked to have you all the way from Holland yes all the way from here all the way happy from to be here. on here yeah, no, I'm super stoked you made the time. And um, how are things over there these days? Are you uh, locked down or are you open up or what's the We are locked down. We are, are locked down. Yes. Yeah. People are uh, people are on all kinds of sides of the fence. And I'm just I'm just trying to stay the course. Stay the course. Yeah, right. We can't let ourselves get too drawn into the dramas, right? Because that could be extremely distracting and kind of keeps on amping up the stress meter and that's for sure. Kind of fly the middle path or just stay above it almost and recognize that that's always, there's always going to be some drama, no matter if it's a pandemic or, you know, some self-induced drama that we create. That's very true. And I think this is always an important part of doing the inner work, which is recognizing what is inner and what is outer, what is my external world and, mm -hmm. and how is my inner world being shaped in relation to the external world. And it seems that, yeah, right now people are, on a let's say like on a global generalizing scale people are more focused on the externals than i've ever seen um which to me is an incredible opportunity to finally recognize that turning inward and kind of disentangling that you know what is my circle of influence and how is the how am i kind of at effect of the world or how can i have an effect on the world that those things are really now kind of open for researching within ourselves sure. finding our own truth but I, I honestly think that um, people have always been externally focused. I mean, that's generally the human condition until you learn to look inward. It's yeah. just that they haven't been in externally focused on at a cultural and systemic level so much. 
they've been doing it at more local drama, their, their family, their disasters, their business disasters. But because the, we're so globally connected now in the past 20 years, and especially with social media, the past five to 10, and the news cycle is so rapid and it's become the VUCA world that everyone can't ignore anymore. Now they've expanded their scope of drama. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. And also the scope of drama is so vastly, vastly more like enormous right. than what we can, than the part of that that we can actually influence. Right. It seems incomprehensible and in, uh, completely out of control. Whereas yeah. people thought they could control their family members. They thought they controlled their businesses. <laughs> yeah. Even though exactly. they were mistaken. <laughs> well, it's an interesting, you know, if you look at if you look at it evolutionary biolo biologically, we're social animals, right? So if you live in a small tribe of 150 people, then having gossip and being up and up in the latest news and knowing everything that goes on in your direct surroundings, everything that you then learn has to do directly with you, you know, including Correct. the weather and including whatever, which animal is walking where and which tracks your brother has seen or, you know, whether the chief is okay with his wife, all of that is vital right. survival information. And we still have that same brain, except now we don't have 150 people tribe in like an, an enclosed right. area. Now we have the entire world and it's entire a big world. challenge. Yeah, no, and you started to go uh, someplace which I think is really important. And I, I want to just kind of talk about this a bit. And then when I get back into your life, is that because we're so globally connected, we have kind of a new, a, a new wave of individuals. And you know, I include us both in this and everyone's listening to my podcast and probably that you're training and Wim Hof and whatnot, who are starting to think, you know what, we can have a worldwide impact right? It, it, I don't have to be constrained in my impact to my 150 person tribe or just my family or, or, or my business that's just trying to make pr profit. Like through our actions, through our consciousness, through our evolution of our consciousness, we can have a global impact to move the world into a more positive place to counteract some of this negative and fear and stress that's going on and to help heal the environment. Do you see that or do you agree with Absolutely, that? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, this is something that definitely keeps me going. Yeah. I'm used to teaching. I mean, I haven't spent this much time not traveling and teaching, um, well, especially traveling in the last five, six years since I've been on this path. I've been traveling nonstop and being mm -hmm. in front of people. But I mean, the last time I spent more than three months not teaching in front of an audience was when I was like 17, you know? So <laughs> to me, it was like, whoa, what to do now? And I decided to just go all in on teaching online and sharing as much as I could. And I could reach people and I get still get daily messages of people who are have been helped by my work. And I only have this tiny little pocket of audience um, compared to a lot of people, of course, you know, and everybody, this is so amazing, you know, when we start to optimize our own life, and we start sharing that, which is interestingly, always the next step that people take, right, as soon as people realize, oh, I can enhance my life, I can optimize my mind, I can live in a better way. And the next step they usually take is to, to want to start sharing that with the world. Right. And I yeah. think uh, like people like you and a lot of the people in our field, they're really the modern heroes and they yeah. all have their, in, their own audience and our audiences overlap and together mm -hmm. we can literally reach people across. I mean, I had a guy from New Zealand who was like, thank you so much for putting your breathing session online for free. Like, I've been listen, listening to it when I go to the supermarket because I was too anxious to go out of my house. And I was like, whoa, New Zealand, you know, oh, that's awesome. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm we, very optimistic. I have no idea how many countries of people listen to the podcast, my podcast or, or involved in what I do. It's hard to know, right? I mean, yeah, but I do know in our coach certification program, we already have 20s out of only um, we started the two years ago, 400 certified coaches now, 27 countries. Wow, that's pretty that's extraordinary. Amazing. My friend Brian yeah. Johnson runs uh, Optimize, and he has a, a similar kind of lifestyle optimization business. And um, his coach program, I think, has 46 countries involved. Wow. It's pretty extraordinary, you know, especially yeah. considering that, you know, I don't know any other language besides English. <laughs> Unfortunate to say, I know you Europeans generally kind of have a grasp on two or three, at least. I have a little grasp on Spanish, but that's not much use here. But everyone seems to be able to, to tap into what we're doing, regardless of where they are in the world, because it seems like English has now become kind of the, the default, which is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. For me, anyways. <laughs> At any rate, so enough on that. Let's talk about you more. Um, I mentioned in the intro that, you know, you were, um, you were not the way you are now for a while. So yeah. tell us about your early your early influences and, and kind of what you were doing and what was the inflection point? Like what? What caught you out of your rut? Well, 
I was in pretty bad shape for many phases of my life. It was always ups and downs, but I, I was struggling with anxiety and with like, I was always the, the chubby kid in the back of the classroom. I couldn't sit still. I couldn't really focus. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of issues around panic and worries and anxiety and these types of things. Um, but the turning point was really when I, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, I was working as a science teacher in a school at the time. And I was mainly on a mission to improve the education system. I was really very excited to be a teacher. Um, I wasn't really planning to be a teacher, but it kind of happened. It's another long story, but kind of ended up in front of the classroom. I was working with these kids and I was like, this is very interesting because um, they don't really know how to learn and nobody's really teaching mm -hmm. them how to learn. Isn't it fascinating that we have this amazing machine that is our brain and we don't really know how to operate it. Mm -hmm. And even though, and I was, as a teacher, I was thinking it's strange to me, at least that as a teacher, as an educator of any sorts, you're are basically a brain programmer, mm -hmm. but we don't really learn how brains work as teachers. Most teachers mm -hmm. have no idea how a brain works. And being a science teacher, I decided to take a more scientific route and be like, okay, so what is known about how the brain learns and how we can improve, not just the um, effectiveness of teaching and learning, but also the joy in this. And then I found that actually increasing the joy and the fun in learning and the creativity actually improves the effectiveness. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because mm -hmm. I took this approach to the process in the classroom, but I wasn't really taking it towards my own life because I was really mm -hmm. taking this seriously. I was overworking myself. I was taking on way too much. I was, I was on the verge of uh, my first burnout. I was in very bad shape. I was about 80 pounds heavier than I am now. I smoked oh. a lot, I drank. Um, okay. And it was a it was a, a time where I just couldn't I couldn't even bear to spend one minute alone with my own mind. I mm -hmm. I would literally be, you know, in bed with a TV on, and I would try to like almost fall asleep, and then at last minute like switch it off and fall asleep, so I didn't have to spend <laughs> listening to my own mental chatter. Right. And, wow. Um, yeah. And what was really an important uh, point for me is that I realized that these kids, they were looking up to me. And I, I was getting a lot of popularity as a teacher at the time because I really cared about their experience in my classroom and I wanted them to have fun. And I was doing all sorts of cool experiments with them. Um, and I wanted to really find ways to improve um, their, the education system at large, but I realized I have to start in my own classroom. And a switch really happened when I realized that I was in a process of using um, scientific concepts and data and, and studies to create little experiments with my students. So for example, I would realize, oh, they have a harder time listening, sitting still. Um, so when, when they have to listen for more than 20 minutes and they're sitting still, they can't focus and they get mm -hmm. these behavioral problems. So what if mm -hmm. I just set a timer and I started working with something very similar to like the Pomodoro technique, for example. Mm -hmm. And then after 15 minutes, a timer would ring and we'd all have to get up and walk around the classroom and get the blood flowing. And then they would sit down and their focus was back. So I started to get this perspective of, wait, we need to incorporate the body. We need mm -hmm. to understand physiology. And from physiology, we can create little experiments and interventions that improve our mental state. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the, the, the thing that I was in. And I started to realize that I had no idea how to apply that to my own mind. Mm. And these kids were looking up to me and I started to realize that it's actually my first responsibility should be to get my own health in check, to get my own mind in check. Mm -hmm. And from there to start being a role model also in terms mm -hmm. of how I appear in front of the classroom, how I, I keep my that. own mind right, how I do my yeah. own lifestyle. So that was really a turning point to make it a step bigger than myself. And you know, really I love that because a lot of we, we have that kind of a wake up call with a lot of the leaders that we coach is that if you want to have any you know, long term effectiveness and and expand your capacity as a leader, you got to lead yourself first. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. eventually either you'll burn out or people will start to see that you lack the overall integrity. You're trying to you're saying one thing and you're doing another thing. So absolutely. You got to work on yourself while you work on your students or with your students. Yeah, that's a, that's a sea change for a lot of people because you go from, you know, that externally focused I mean, it's to do this for other people. And a lot of people, even in, in service and philanthropy, they're all doing it for other people. And then, you know, their own life is a bag of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And also <laughs> so if you, it's, it's me and we, we got to take care of ourselves in order to take care of others. Exactly. And the more you, the more you have in terms of energy and passion, the more you can actually give. And a lot That's of people, they sacrifice give. their own energy and That's then right. they can't give anymore. Yeah. That's fascinating. So you started to experiment, you first started experimenting with the kids and then you, you started to turn the, the lens back on yourself. So 
what did you do? Like, what were the, some of the strategy you used to, to turn your own mind around? Well, the, one of the first things when I was really in a rut and I was really depressed and I, I, I couldn't bear being around my own thoughts for a second was I started getting into, uh, into meditation and I actually mm -hmm. learned it first through uh, self hypnosis. Uh, I went mm -hmm. to a hypnotherapist nice. and I learned all these mental techniques to kind of dissect within my own mind. What are these thoughts and to get a little bit of distance and um, these mind focused uh, techniques were really helpful to me, mm -hmm. but the, the, the biggest shift really came when I started to, uh, understand my physiology more and mm -hmm. to really look at it at, at the state of mind mm -hmm. from a physiological perspective. So I saw, for example, a lot of kids with anxiety and with stress. And I was like, well, I know these problems and I could recognize them in them because they were literally hyperventilating in front of my classroom. Right. And I was like, wait, I've been, I've been struggling with these issues my whole life. I know how they work. You know, I studied, uh, I studied to be a biology teacher. I teach science. I know how catecholamines work, but I've never learned to apply physiology and biological understanding to lifestyle interventions. I was like, why didn't, why didn't I ever do that? So mm -hmm. for example, one experiment I ran with my students is I realized they're in, they're in the sympathetic uh, nervous system, they're mm -hmm. stressed, they've got, you know, adrenaline, cortisol pumping. And I read this study that said that, you know, uh, mammals, humans, when we see baby mammals, we have a release of a chemical called oxytocin mm -hmm. and it calms us down and it down regulates us out of the sympathetic nervous system. So mm -hmm. I was like, wait, that's interesting. So I started, for example, to, um, uh, if my, these kids would have to make a physics test, for example, they'd come in and I'd have this projector screen in the classroom. And I would have this, uh, compilation on YouTube of cute kittens and cute puppies <laughs> playing on the screen. I thought you were going to say you brought some kittens in, but <laughs> oh, I wish, I wish that would be, that would be amazing. And, but the first assignment would literally be stare at these kittens until you relax. And then we'd go, ah, oh, oh, these cute. And I could see like, now I know I could see the, their vagus nerve stimulating, basically right. activating, and they would calm down. And later on, I found a study that said, hey, if you slow down your breath, mm -hmm. um, you will stimulate the vagus nerve and calm mm -hmm. yourself out of these stressful states. Right. So these are some of the ways that I started looking at it. And uh, I had done a bunch of diets before I had tried <clears throat> a bunch of different meditation techniques. Um, I tried to get into working out and, and losing weight, but the whole time it was still me really forcing myself into those things instead of really understanding how they work. So as soon as I started understanding how they worked and I realized that my body was chronically stuck in a sympathetic nervous system mode in a fight flight state, mm -hmm. then I could start to more specifically pinpoint things that would move me out of that state and bring me back. And funnily enough, uh, it had to do with um, basically overloading my sympathetic system with intense challenges. Like for example, you know, I started running, I wanted to run barefoot. I set myself a challenge to run a barefoot marathon on an empty stomach. And <laughs> I was like, all right, so that means I need to retrain my feet. I need to start, um, uh, I need to start working with fasting, with intermittent fasting. And, um, I did a lot of cold training also, you know, ice baths mm -hmm. and cold showers. And I started to really look at the, my nervous system as almost like a graph, you know, every day I would look at the graph of my nervous system and be like, when did I move up? When did I move down? What moved me there? What, what could move me back? So, um, a lot of things that people would consider extreme, like taking ice baths, like mm -hmm. doing longer fasts. Uh, I tried a lot of different, um, uh, diets, um, and, uh, different meditation techniques. And out of all of that, I found that the, the common thread within all of that was basically the breath and that right. the breath whatever you do, whatever change is happening in your external environment, your internal environment needs to adapt to that. Right. This is what resilience really is. And my issues were really a lack of resilience, a lack of adaptability to external circumstances. And the first thing that needs to adapt, and this is what I always say is the breath, the breath is the first responder of the nervous system. So as soon as input comes into the system from the outside, and you need to either increase or decrease metabolism, you need to either become more active or more calm, you need to be more alert. Um, all of these things, they start with a change at a cellular level, so a metabolic change, and that metabolic change is provided uh, uh, with by the breath. So this is really kind of like my path of trying all these different things and then realizing that there are core principles at the, at the source of all of these changes mm -hmm. and all of these lifestyle things. And if we can understand mm -hmm. those, then we can be free in our choices. Yeah, I agree with that. That's really interesting. Although I wouldn't think the breath has much to do with running barefoot. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it's definitely. But it does um, have to do with the cold bath, right? Because I, you know, we well, do cold, cold showers. In, in the end, bath, breath has probably. to do with with just about anything. I mean, that the, the bare feet was more to add a, an extra layer of challenge, and also to be more immersed in the experience. Right. Yeah, I can see that. When I walk on the beach, we walk barefoot. I walk barefoot quite a bit, and but I do it. I live in San Diego, so it's a little bit easier for me to do that. That's beautiful. So. Um, you went through this huge phase of experimentation. Now, can you, can we get into kind of what you have distilled or kind of settled on as some best practices for things like, and I'm going to draw from my own languaging here, because as you alluded to, breath can create all sorts of both physiological and psychological state changes, as well as long-term breath practices can lead to uh, stage changes in terms of who you think you are, like developmentally conscious conscious awareness like shifts so what are some of you know let's start out with like mark one motto what i learned in the navy seals around concentration you know learning to really control our attention and stay concentrated on our mission until we're like done period you know home safe that is a technique or a skill that i learned ad nauseum first through zen my zen training and then you know basically in the navy seals how you know what is your best practices around that? Because that's something you already alluded to. You had to get good with kids on, right? Yeah. So um, focus and staying on track um, is very much about limiting all the other options. So to, mm. to have a very, very clear place where you want to put your attention. Uh, attention is a mental state, a mental function that or I should say focus, like focusing your attention as a mental function is very expensive. It costs a lot of energy in the prefrontal lobe. Right. So we need something to allow us to stay with that. And as soon as something else comes in that might be more interesting or more dangerous or more, you know, it, it, it distracts you, then it takes a lot of energy to stay with this one thing. Um, so the mind has this tendency to move ahead or to move back or to move to all of these different places. So we need to have something that anchors us in, in the, the here and now, in the present. And of course, mm -hmm. all the esoteric practices are focused on being in the present. Mm -hmm. Now, very practically, I have found that lengthening, so consciously lengthening an exhale is the most powerful way to maintain focus. So to really just have the inhale in any way you want, because the inhale is more of a sympathetic function and then lengthening the exhale for maybe 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds, depending on the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. So as, and this is the same thing for like running that marathon marathon or taking on challenges, as soon as I would lose the control or the consciousness of what my exhale was doing, I would generally lose focus and I would get, you know, sidetracked. So mm -hmm. I think that being able to consciously, con and there's a lot of research to this and the yogis have described this at length, mm -hmm. of course, all, all, also. Um, Controlling your exhale, that's really where the window of opportunity really lies to keep your, your uh, concentration, your attention with whatever it is that you need to do. I love that. That synchronizes 100% with um, some of our teaching around breath, breath control being the first and, and kind of master practice, right? Yes. That, that leads your mind and your body, it leads your body toward de-stressing and toward, you know, ultimate balance, homeostatic balance, but it leads your mind toward that kind of focused but also calm state because you can be focused and agitated and you'll have less energy over the long haul but if you can be focused and calm then you just keep on regenerating your energy and this is how running an ultra marathon becomes somewhat easy once you kind of get this right because it's one foot in front of the other inhale slow exhale one foot in front yes of the other. and you're just yeah. regenerating while you're going right because you're maintaining that stress response parasympathetic that's absolutely terrific. I love that. And now we, I like the, the mother's breath, that, that nice slow exhale is a beautiful breath to bleed off stress. And I've never thought of it as a way to maintain concentration, but that, I could definitely see that working really well. We use the breath hold practice of box breathing, where you're concentrating on the whole pattern, all four, all four patterns, inhale, hold, exhale, and hold. And that seems to work really well for us as well. That's amazing. So you talked about presence, right? And the, the minds of, you know, propensity to skip to the future, skip to the past. And I honestly don't think many people in the world are truly present, you know, the way we would understand, you know, like the Taoist or the, the you know, the, the yogis would talk about presence. 
how do you maintain presence and, and how do you teach that? I think presence is a constant practice. Mm -hmm. It is really recognizing when you're out of it as often as possible and then kindly loving you, lovingly bringing yourself back to it. Mm -hmm. There's in the modern world, there's so many things that move us out of it. And uh, especially now, you know, like we talked about in the beginning with people being so concerned with all the external opinions and influences and, and changes and all of this stuff that it's so easy to not be present with yourself at all. And for me, presence is very much about building a practice of which I know that is going to allow me to be more present. And the funny thing is, well, at least to me, allowing is a really important word there because I've I've tried for years and years to, because I understood the concept. I was like, yes, I'm anxious, you know, and I'm worried and I'm depressed. And that is me not living in the present moment. And then there's this, this, this present moment on the other side that apparently I have to get to. And then I would use this anxious, worried mind to push myself towards the present, which is this game that costs <laughs> so much energy. <laughs> you right. can, and you can play it your whole life. It doesn't work. So instead of making it happen, I was, uh, I've learned to focus more on allowing it to happen, letting it happen. And letting it happen really um, is first of all about circumstances. So the question is, which circumstances do you build into your life and how do they either allow you or disallow you to be present? So for example, very, very basic things, very simple things that are, that are you know, difficult uh, uh, on a day to day is for example, not looking at my screens and my social media or anything the first two hours of the day and the last two hours of the day to know mm -hmm. that I start and end the day with my own mind on my terms. This mm -hmm. is such an important thing, especially if you like, you know, like me, like us work in social media, because that's where you, you reach your audience, you know, and mm -hmm. there's always another question and there's always something else to do. So really um, having a, a way to start the day where you know this is going to allow my attention to be there with me. Another one is to understand uh, the physiological state that allows for presence of being. If you are more at rest, so if you're metabolically more close to a homeostatic rest, right? So you're, which basically means that you're comfortable, you know, you're at a place where your, your body knows it is safe. There's this internal perception of safety. Then it's much more easy to be present. So presence can actually be pointed at as a nervous system state. When your parasympathetic mm. chain is active, it is far easier to be present. And as soon as a hint of danger or unsafety comes in, you start to, you know, look in the corners of your eyes and, and seek for a way out or see what is the next threat. And this is a physiological state. And this is in my teachings, a very important key, key thing that yes, we have top down regulation, which means we can take our mind and we can will our body into a different state. However, mm. the body is usually more powerful because it's, uh, you know, the larger part of our autopilot is made out of the body. So if we can bring the body into a state of calmness, of safety, then we can bring our mind to presence. And this is why box breathing, like you just said, is such an amazing example. This is, you know, the people who developed this, they clearly understood that in those cases that these operatives would need to calm their mind, mm -hmm. we can give them all kinds of things to think about. We can give them affirmations. We can give them stuff to say to themselves, or we can calm their breath, which gives an immediate perception of safety in the body. Right? As we, the, the switch from being out of control of breath to in control of breath is a switch to being completely out of control, which is unsafe and much more too much more uh, feeling much more safe. Now, as soon as mm -hmm. there's this internal perception of safety, it is much more easy to be like, okay, what's going on here? You know, um, where does my attention really need to go to observe yourself in a certain moment? So breath again is a very important one, getting the right amount of, amounts of sleep, getting the right amounts of movement. Mm -hmm. You know, these are mm -hmm. uh, really physical things, uh, the, kind, the right kind of food, these types of things, very, very physiological right. based interventions that allow you to be there. But it's only if you can really decide to take control over the circumstances. And again, right. you can't take control over the circumstances of the world. You can't decide, you can't control the political situation, this virus situation. What you can control is your direct environment and whether or not you're going to look at your screen at all of this external information. Right. One of the things that's coming up with me now, which I think is, again, simple, but not easy, but it's profound if, if 
people can get this is that most people, when they begin to think about, oh, I've got to get my control of my life, they will, um, they will think about things like exercise and nutrition and sleep and all the, all the biohacking. And um, as you're aware that there is some efficacy in that. But if you could flip it, right, and think about um, regulating your breath, beginning to, to practice breath control, and to begin to eradicate the negative patterns, you know, so through mindfulness, that are causing you or preventing you from feeling worthy or feeling good enough at going to the gym and, and not putting that extra cookie in your mouth and staying up, you know, to watch that extra movie, because you just, like you said, you just can't stand being with yourself. You actually start from the inside out, then you'll have much more effective time. You'll be led automatically to change those exteriors. And so then they work together and it's a much yes. quicker process. It's an acceleration of your, absolutely because it's more integrated. It's, it's, it's yeah. And it comes from right within. Place. And I really, I really like that you said that because it, this is really also about the why of these things. You That's know, correct. if you are living a, in a life where, uh, for example, you have a corporate job that is really like sucking your soul. I'm not saying all corporate jobs are like this, but I That's meet true. a lot of people. Like, who are in I've been there for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I work with so many like elite professionals and CEOs and people climbing the ladder and they're asking me to help them, you know, hack their energy levels and their focus and improve their sleep. And they're like, I'm anxious and all these things. And I go like, well, I could take you through this whole program of getting the optimal nutrition and the optimal breathing practice and the optimal movement, all this stuff. But if you're only and the question is, why are you doing it? What are you optimizing your life for? If you are only doing it to be able to perform within, for example, a corporate system that is toxic to you and it makes you unhappy, or you work for a corporation that does something that doesn't add anything of value to your to the way that you want to see the world, for example, and you don't really believe in what you're doing, then all of that optimization is only going to make you incrementally better. Well, it's going to make you better for sure, but it's going to make you better at something that makes you miserable. So you're Correct. going to end up with, you know, in the same spot right. later on. I love that. We call that horizontal development where you get better at the skills you already have, but it doesn't change who you are. Exactly. Yeah. So that's Absolutely. okay. But what we want is vertical development where you, you're asking better questions and you're getting better answers. So your why shifts and it becomes a, a much more inclusive why. And yes. when people have those paradigm shifts, those transcend and include moments, oftentimes they're like, well, I don't, I'm not even sure why I'm in this, this, you know, it's like that song. This is <laughs> yeah. not my beautiful wife. This is not my beautiful car or home. Like, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? So we want to shift and change ourselves while we become more effective at also doing the things that we need to do. Yes. That's powerful. So that's kind of alluding to, or kind of pointing me toward one of my favorite topics is um, using breath to really unlock intuition and to develop spiritually. Because when we're talking about your why, we're talking about, you know, like, Krishna and Arjuna's conversation on the battlefield, like, why are we doing this? You, you know, Arjuna questioning his life. That's spirituality to me. You know, it's like getting clear about why we're on this planet, what our karmic energy is, what our dharma or what our calling is. It has nothing to do with, you know, I mean, spiritual energy can be enhanced and maybe enlightened through reading of scripture and going to church and all these things. But truly, really ultimately, the internally being able to answer those questions with clarity right and so how do we use the breath to open up our intuition and to develop spiritually from your perspective oh that's such a good question yeah i love this topic because it's so fascinating um first of all not being connected to purpose not being connected to spirit is in a way a function of the mind Mm -hmm. So as we are born and I see this in, in my own daughter, you know, uh, we, we are born into this world as a Buddha, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we're enlightened and, and we're present and and we don't even need a purpose yet because life is just living. Right. At some point, we develop layers and these are layers of protection, which mm -hmm. are completely functional for a very large part of our life. Mm -hmm. And these layers are usually behavioral layers that, that are very much in the mind. So we have an experience, we interpret that experience from that inter interpretation, we draw a conclusion about who we are, who we need to be in the world. You know, for example, you, 
and it starts very simple, right? It's like you're a kid and you throw something and it falls and then it breaks and it makes you sad. And then you go like, oh, I shouldn't do that. Or, or you throw something and it falls and it breaks and your dad gets upset and you go like, oh, I, apparently I can make dad upset. I shouldn't do that. Or, or, <laughs> or you throw it and it falls and dad gets upset and you go like, hey, I can control dad's emotions. And that's interesting, right? So right. whatever way you have experiences and you interpret them and based on that, you decide how to interact with the world. So if you're if you're very young and, for example, you learn that uh, your parents are fighting and if you're super happy and jolly and 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 perfect, then uh, your parents are, you know, are, are a bit more balanced. And then you feel like, oh, right. so who I am in this world is I need to be that person that sacrifices themselves for the harmony of other people and you become a pleaser. Other people learn to, you know, get into the fight or actually like try to always have to win in order to show that they are alive or that they are worthy. So basically, we condition ourselves, we build conditioning that gives us a sense of safety, but that fundamentally moves us away from our truest, deepest inner truth and inner feeling. So we get this disconnect through um, conditioning. Mm -hmm. And this disconnect is from that, that feeling of purpose and that spirituality. Now, this is, of course, been written about in all mm -hmm. the ancient scriptures and modern mm -hmm. psychology, all of these things. But how does this interact with breath work? Well, right. Our mind tries to control, so our conscious mind, our cognitive thinking, tries to control as many variables as possible in order to keep the old survival systems in check. Right. When we do intense breath work, if, so this means, for example, super ventilative practices where you do like very Hoff, intense so, breathing. Yeah. There, yeah, there, and Wim Hof method there uh, has different protocols for that. There's holotropic breathing, transformational, mm -hmm. rebirth. Well, there's, mm -hmm. there's so many amazing methods for this. We start to increase our breathing pace, which means that we offload a lot of CO2. When we offload CO2, we get vasoconstriction in the extremities, but also in our brain. Now, as soon, what also happens is we're going, as soon as you start to speed up the breath, the body and the brain, they kind of assume that there is a reason to go into fight and flight, right? So if you have to whatever, run a bit, run away for a threat, you go into fight and flight, mm -hmm. and you start to breathe heavy, but it also works the other way around, you start to breathe heavy, and your body goes into this heightened state. Mm -hmm. So what we're now having is a cocktail of effects where we have basically vasoconstriction, we have less oxygen going to the prefrontal lobe, which is our thinker, which means that our thinking brain, our logical thinking brain has to kind of calm down a little bit because it's the most um, expensive function. So mm -hmm. our mind becomes more quiet. And because we have triggered the sympathetic nervous system, our autom autonomic nervous system needs to come become active. And we're for example, working with the fear system, which is part of our limbic system, which is our emotional brain. So consider that we have this cognitive thinking brain, uh, our rational mind costs a lot of energy, and it almost sits on top of this emotional brain, and it mm -hmm. tries to suppress it. So our inhibitions live in our co conscious mind. Mm -hmm. So with our conscious mind, we try to control life, I'm this person, and I identify with this, and I need to do this in order to be good enough. And then we do breath work. And suddenly, that function of your brain starts to come down a few notches. And then the other things that are also living inside of you that you usually don't allow yourself to feel, that you don't allow yourself to experience, like for example, heavy emotions, sadness, you know, grief, anger, or even memories of uh, very intense moments that happened in your childhood life that you associate with this, this safety, those things are suddenly more capable of coming to the surface, but also mm -hmm. Releasing, if you do this in a safe setting and you're being facilitated and you feel safe to finally allow those emotions to flow, then you can get that conscious mind out of the way, not fully out of the way, of course, but I'm, I'm kind of like trying to say mm -hmm. it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and those emotions can flow. And when these emotions flow, we are getting back in touch with our emotion, which means we're with our heart, right? Our emotional mm -hmm. heart. We're mm -hmm. having moments of healing. We have mm -hmm. a moment of transcendence. To mm -hmm. give that a practical definition, we transcend. Mm -hmm. So we lift up from our normal day-to-day -day thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we enter a different state of consciousness through right. this process. Mm -hmm. And in that state, we can release the emotions that we've been pushing down. And then finally, we can actually start to listen to our intuitive self mm -hmm. without being afraid of listening to our heart and suddenly have to feel like, you know, sad or have to feel grief or have these memories come up because you can actually release them and, and deload them from your system. Yeah. And if we do that more often, we can start to trust more and more that if we check in with ourselves, we center ourselves, 
we check in with our heart, we check in with our emotional state, we really tune into what we feel. And then we can ask, wait, is this thought that I'm having, is that really the most important thing to me? Or is this core heart and gut feeling that I'm having, is that's what's most important to me? And I think right. that really leads us to becoming more intuitive and more spiritually aligned. I agree. Well said, I love that description. And with, with our training, we do something called a breath empowerment, which is, it's, you know, similar to what we were talking about. Um, and it's about 45 minutes long and three sets. And we're always, you know, the experiences that you're talking about always happen. You know, it's, it's like magic. You, 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 the breath just does not fail to deliver every single time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And everyone like, you know, I I've run them many times, but I love to have my tai, our tai Chi master, Will Potter. It's just magical at running them. Just something about the energy that it brings. And so everyone thinks, Oh, Will, you're amazing. <laughs> and Will's like, I, I didn't do anything. I just, exactly. you know, it's the breath. And so emotional, we tend to see, um, people first having physiological reactions, twitching and, you know, all sorts of weird shit happening. And then they have the, um, the emotional kind of response, you know, they're tearing up and, you know, and then they start to have the intuitive and spiritual. And so this can happen in one setting, like kind of in that order, right? Cause my sense is, you know, a lot of people have to kind of get through the physical layer, you know, like think about the, like a kosha's thing you know, from mm -hmm. the yoga tradition, go through that physical mental layer to get into that emotional layer. Then once you kind of get through that stuckness, then you have access to that intuitive and that spiritual messaging. Or it can happen kind of in that general progression over time, right? So if you start a, a practice like this, you know, first you're going to experience it physically and you're going to feel different. And then you're going to start opening up all the emotions and then starting to recognize your emotional life and the, you know, the patterns and the trauma and the shadow. And then once you start to deal with that, then you start to experience and so it follows a similar path to, um, to like a meditative process. If you stick with it, like my experience with Zen, I stuck with it for four years before I went into the seals. And I went through a very similar process. First, wow. it was experienced physically, then emotionally, and then intuitively and spiritually. I'm just kind of like piling on top of what you said. I don't know if I have a question here, but what the question that's always come up with me with regards to this work is a lot of people say after these breathwork sessions, gosh, you know, do you have a tape? Cause I want to do this every day. And <laughs> yeah. my, my warning is always don't do this every day, right? This is too, it's too intense, right? So you're, you're not really ready for it. This is kind of like maybe the Kundalini world has driven a few Westerners crazy because yeah. Kundalini is super intense breathing. And, and if your mind isn't ready for it, you're moving too much energy, right? Do you agree? It's like, I don't think these practices are meant to be done every day. Once a week, you probably get away with once to, uh, every other week, even, or maybe, maybe if you're a healthy individual and you've been training physically and you, you know, got a strong, uh, strong, um, egoic structures, let's say it that way. If you've got strong egoic structures, it's much safer. If you have attachment disorder and serious childhood trauma that you've masked over, then this breath work, this intense breath work can be extremely dangerous for some people. Yeah, it should only be there. done under good guidance and every now and then. I I, um, I I train a lot of breath coaches, a lot of people that have been breath coaches for a very long time, and they want to they want to work from a deeper level of mastery. That's really where where my main field is. And uh, I always have to remind them stop chasing the high. Yeah, like, exactly. don't chase the high. That's and right. This is don't really chase the high. People have this one moment of like, wow, oh my god, yeah, yeah, they have a breakthrough peak experience, and they want exactly to every time, right? And 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 then they want to have that every day. But the question is, how do you take that moment and how do you integrate that in your daily life? Because, you know, people feel that same way after having a near death experience, for example, but I wouldn't right. suggest and you wouldn't want that every day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because exactly. we're basically creating a physiological near death through this breathing practice. Now, I've, I've been able to I've, I've been really nerding out on exactly what happens in the nervous system with these different breathing patterns. And I've been able to get people to that state quicker and quicker and understanding how how to get them there. But even then, even if it's a 20 minute practice, still, it's something that's very intense. And people really want to skip to that feeling that they have mm -hmm. afterwards, where they're like, now everything makes sense. But mm -hmm. you can't always live there. It's kind of that, that, that thing of like, you know, before enlightenment, 
chop yeah, wood, carry take, water. Take out the trash. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So um, my uh, very important principle for me is minimum effective dose. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you have this breathing practice, you have this tremendous awareness, then you need to come into meditation and preferably in a, in a guided setting with somebody who can integrate and help you find, locate literally that feeling of elation, that feeling of safety, of, of, an, of transcendence, find that somewhere in yourself, in your body, and right. then create anchors in order to get to that feeling without having to do the extreme uh, breath work to get there. And even just with a few breaths, you can start mm -hmm. to anchor yourself into that state and remind yourself of that moment without having right. to necessarily do the entire practice every single time. Right. Because the, the, the whole idea is to take less and less work, less and less effort, less and less breathing to get to that same spot. So the first time you needed, you know, 45 minutes and a whole lifetime of trauma processing to get there. But what if you could get there within two breaths a year from now? Right. And eventually, we want to let go of all the practices yes. and just live in that state. And that's ultimately, Absolutely. you know, what the, you know, the traditions teach is that eventually you want to let, let go of the crutch of having to do this practice and then that practice and this practice and that practice. And, yeah. you know, as Westerners, we think the practice is the thing, but it's ultimately just a, it's a pointing, it's a pointing mechanism. Oh, that's, that's such an important thing. I'm happy you said that because when I started out on this path, I needed so much practice to even get through the day without being depressed or without eating junk food all day or like without smoking cigarettes. So I was literally like every second of the day, I had some kind of thing, some kind of anchor, some like a breathing practice and a workout and a mental training and an affirmation and a whole house full of affirmations. <laughs> I totally and then, know what you're talking about because yeah, you described and, my life for many years. <laughs> exactly. And it's, and it's an important phase. I mean, I'm not condescending sure. to it at all. Right, You've got to go through that you know very few but people there has to be zero, a point where then it becomes right. your autopilot and it becomes more automatic and now people ask me like hey how many like how many hours do you practice breath and meditation per day and i go like well barely anything if i wake up and i can do a, a two minute like meditative self check-in and i can see where my breath is and i can feel my heart rate variability and i can feel connected to my purpose i'm not going to spend any time on my meditation cushion i'm going to i'm going to do my work because i'm on my i'm on right. my sacred path of purpose in life so every, every moment second i can spend on right. that exactly yeah right. totally yeah. i love that we could go on like this for hours especially now that we're kind of heading into the really cool stuff but um we've already been going for about 45 minutes uh, i do want to talk about your um you mentioned to me you put well let me back up both of us participated in um, our, our friend, mutual friend, Dan Brulé's um, breathing festival, right? And so yes. I want to, and, and that was neat. I really enjoyed doing that. It's such, such an important subject and it's super, I don't even know if it's, if they're charging for this thing. I think it's free, isn't it? Or are they charging just a No, they're charching, but it's, it's not much. It's, it's, it's barely cool. anything compared to. <laughs> right. It's like a hundred bucks getting. or something. It's, and you get some amazing breathing instruction from like 20 or 30 of the world's most phenomenal, uh, you know, breath teachers, including you, Casper. I'm in there, Dan's in there. I don't know if Wim Hof ended up doing it, um, but tons of others. This is how you and I met. And I wanted to um, point that out to listeners that um, this is, it's, it's, it's basically doled out to you where you can kind of like listen to it asynchronously. You don't have to like sign up and do you know take a weekend out of your life or anything like that so i think it was great the way they put it together um the the link to it will be on the show notes uh in the podcast but if you don't end up seeing that and you um have a good memory it's uh https you know because it's a secret protocol colon you know double backslash anyways but the main url is the i c f b the ICFB, I say International Conference for Breathing. Is that what that stands for? Breathing right? Festival, yeah. ICFB. Yeah, breathing yeah, Festival, breathing, yeah. yeah. The the International Conference for Breathing Festival, something like that, dot com. And then my uh, particular URL has a slash six eight slash festival. And I'm sure uh, you probably have your own URL, but I, I put that out because it's my podcast. Of course. The ICFB.com slash six eight slash festival. And you can check that out. But then, um, Casper, you are, have created a new uh, breathing certification for coaches. I, I'm actually really interested in that personally. Tell us about that and, and where we can learn more about that. 
Yeah, so it's called Breathwork Masterclass. And I, it started out as just a, a five day masterclass where I was like, I can use it. I can just teach everything I know in five days and that'll be mm -hmm. it. And then I realized I need more education because there's so much going on. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I've got three levels. The first one is called Breathwork Biohacker. It's an online course, so especially now in COVID times, everybody's more interested in breathing and really understanding what it's about. And it's a super um, extensive online uh, masterclass. And then I have mm -hmm. um, some events where we do some pretty cutting edge stuff. We actually go and we dissect actual lungs from animals. We look into the tissue, we use microscopes and wow. scalpels and we dissect hearts and we really get into the tissue. It's a, a really try to bring together the most innovative teaching practices that I could find. We work with microdosing uh, psilocybin, for example, in combination with breath work. Wow, um, interesting. And we use nootropic supplements and we really well, try not, to You stay. don't do that online, do you, that part? No, we don't do that online, no. <laughs> the, we, the so eating be kind of mushroom tricky. cutting into sheep lungs, we do that here in the Netherlands <laughs> where everything is very legal. And, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and we have these events that are, so we do all this really cool stuff on a professional level, but also really deep uh, personal breakthroughs where I teach people how to, so it's really principle based, which means that in my um, way of working, the same core principles that are fairly simple to understand can allow you to coach uh, a top level CEO to have less anxiety. It can allow you to coach a Olympic athlete to perform better on the field. It can allow you to give some help somebody have this transcendent emotional breakthrough. It's all mm -hmm. based on the same principles. So we don't focus on any specific method or technique, but really right. at the core of how does this work it. and how can we help people yeah. a step beyond. So this is this is my biggest uh, project now. I'm very excited about it. And uh, it's launching this month. Uh, it's it's we've been doing it for a while, but it's we've now really put it into uh, into the proper shape and form that it needs to be. Awesome. So I if anybody wants to check that out, you can check out yeah. breathworkmasterclass.com. Or if you um, uh, want to check out some of my, I have some free uh, online breathing sessions also that people can just follow. Um, and you can find it. Actually, find me on Instagram is the easiest, at Casper's Focus, Casper with a K, uh, K-A-S-P-E-R-S-F-O-C-U-S. -S -S. And then a link in my bio, you can find uh, uh, all kinds of cool free um, resources to get started on. Nice. Well, I appreciate that. So breathworkmasterclass.com. I'm going to check that out myself. This sounds fun. I would love to come over and play with um, some of your dissection and getting under, you know, looking inside a heart. I remember we did a uh, dissected a cadaver as part of my, it wasn't part of the SEAL curriculum, but one of our um, instructors was fascinated and was, you know, slated to go to med school. And so he ended up arranging for us to go to the core. Wow. It was, it was fascinating. It's, it's um, not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. It is not. But, uh, Casper, thanks so much for your time um, and for doing this um, valuable work. Like it's really important uh, that everybody listening, you know, get control of your breath and begin to turn inward and to be the change you want to see in the world. And then to let, and let that just let that naturally ripple out into everyone you touch. And she's, you know, one person at a time, right? For we'll sure. really start to slow down the rattle and hum of this world. <laughs> Right. absolutely make it less VUCA so I appreciate what you're doing and if you're ever over in uh, the United States I'm in San Diego let's let's arrange a get together and do some breathing together I'll be back there soon absolutely thank you thank you for your okay. time and for your awesome work yeah thank you very much who yeah all right folks uh, that's uh, that's fascinating huh so Casper uh, Vander Mullen go check it out his Instagram please say your Instagram again your uh, Casper's uh, focus Casper's plural focus, focus. yeah Got it. Casper's at Casper's focus. Um, the the uh, breathworkmasterclass.com. That'll be launched by the time I think by the time this podcast is uh, live. For sure. Yes. Awesome. It's important stuff. What a fun conversation. Thanks very much again. Thank you. All right, folks. That, that's uh, it. That's a wrap for today. So take a few deep breaths. Inhale five count. Exhale ten. Let that be your concentration practice and let's give it, uh, let's give that 30 days. Let's give it a try and uh, let's, let's prove Casper correct that that in itself can be a path to mastery. And until next time, stay focused and be unbeatable. This is Mark Devine. Hoo-yah.